I'm the doctor. Have you ever thought what it's like to be wanderers in the fourth dimension? Okay, so Doctor Who's three 60th anniversary specials are all done, and we've had a chance to see them all, so let's talk about them. Yeah, yeah, the Star Beast. Yeah, so originally when I reviewed this episode, I literally had just seen it for the first time, and that's something I regret now because of how positive I was in my review of the episode, and I've since decided to delete the video because after re-watching the Star Beast again, yeah, my opinion has certainly changed. It's, it's, it's not good. It's, it's not good at all. Basically, when I watched it for the first time, I was watching it wearing rose-tinted glasses because it was David Tennant returning as the Doctor and Catherine Tate as Donna Noble and RTD was coming back, you know, the original showrunner from the new series and he was coming to restore Doctor Who back to its former glory. Because I'll admit it, I really, really wasn't a fan of the whole Chris Chibnall, Jodie Whittaker era. Just down to the whole writing of the episodes and the characterization of the Doctor and how the companions felt very one note and just... Ugh, don't even get me started with the Timeless Children. What the fuck is that? So I wanted so desperately for this once magical show to get back to those days of just having a great well-written episodes with really likeable engaging characters that you actually care about going off in adventures through time and space. Upon my second viewing, yeah, it became very clear and settled in pretty fast. So if you've been living under a rock or just weren't aware, the Star Beast is based upon a comic called Doctor Who and the Star Beast that came out back in the 80s. The story was about this alien that crash lands on Earth and is looked after by these two young kids called Sharon and Fudge and the Meep, which is this alien that has crash landed here, is being pursued by the Wrath Warriors, yada yada yada. Basically check out the comic, it's, it's a pretty good comic, highly recommend it, go check it out. So this new adaptation takes the baseline of the story of the comic, with this cute alien Axel innocent and friendly and involves the Doctor crossing paths once again with his old friend Donna Noble and her family. And the Doctor not only has to protect the Meep as well as the Noble family from danger, but also has to ensure that Donna doesn't remember him or she will die. Okay, so the episode itself is heavily, heavily focused on its pro-trans message and being centered around Rose Noble, Donna's daughter, who is played by a trans person, which I, I personally don't have a problem with the message itself. I don't have a problem with trans people and I don't really have a problem with Rose as a character. It's just the way she's written within this episode. And there's two moments in particular that really stood out for me with how they tried to hammer down the message and really throw it right in your face. So the first scene that bothered me was there's a moment within the episode where the Doctor automatically assumes the Meep's chosen pronoun is that of he. And Rose corrects him saying, why do you automatically assume that its chosen pronoun would be he? And the Doctor says something to the effect of, oh yes, good point. Are you a he, a she, or a they? I mean, I just found that scene very unnecessary. It didn't add anything to the plot. You could have removed it and it wouldn't have diminished anything. It would have taken away from anything. It's just, it feels completely inconsequential and you could have just taken it out and the story would have been fine without it. Now the other one comes towards the end of the episode and I must admit, this is something I completely missed upon my first watch. I don't know, it just flew over me. I. I mustn't have been concentrating or whatever, but I completely missed it. The second watch I saw it, I was like, oh, what? After the Doctor gives Donna back her memories because like the Meep was trying to blast off in its ship and it was going to destroy most of London. So the Doctor had to give Donna back her memories because he couldn't do it by himself because he was literally cut off in one section of the ship and he needed Donna's help. So it comes after that where it has the resolution of the Metacrisis. So Rose says, this is something a male presenting Time Lord would never understand. Just let it go. I mean, wow, way to go in not only just insulting the Doctor, because he's a man, but you've pretty much just insulted half, maybe more of your target audience, so way to go Rose, thank you. I mean, the story itself, it's pretty loose when it actually comes to the plot of the story. It's very focused on its message that it's trying to get across, and at times it does feel like it is screaming in your face. It's like, okay, I understand the message. There are some good moments within the episode, like I really love the trial scene where he's putting the Meep and the Wrath Warriors on trial, and he pulls out this barrister's wig, 
and that was very much reminiscent and playing almost a, a homage to the scene where the fourth doctor is getting judged by these robotic justice machines called the Megara in the Stones of Blood. And I absolutely love that, mainly because I have such a huge affection for the Stones of Blood. But it, it's it's such a, a doctor thing to do, and it's so quirky, and I, I, I really love that moment. And there's another scene where Donna and Rose are walking home, and Rose is getting bullied by uh, these schoolboys for being trans now you really sympathize with rose in that moment that's that's a scene i think works really well in terms of the message you know that scene worked well most of the other stuff doesn't but like that one is like yes you got me to sympathize with rose in that moment i thought that was done really well I like the fact that you know donna gave away all her lottery winnings because her subconscious was essentially trying to make her more like the Doctor and be more kind. And as soon as she gets her memories back and she instantly goes off about how she gave away all her money, I think that was such a very in-character thing for Donna to do. I really like that moment. It's it's something that you completely imagine Donna doing. And then we got introduced to a new character, Unit's newest scientific advisor, Shirley Ann Bingham. I thought she was fine. Um, not really any complaints with her. And I thought it was directed really well by Rachel Talalay, who has to be one of the best modern series directors ever. I think she's done some amazing work, especially if you look at the Capaldi finales of like each season. And I love how the production team brought both the Wrath Warriors and the Meep from their design in the comic to live action. They replicated that brilliantly well. There was things though that wasn't actually included within the episodes from the comic. Like, there's a moment at the beginning of the comic where the Doctor lands on board the Wrath Warrior's spaceship and they implant a bomb inside him, and I'm actually glad they didn't include that because it's kind of messed up, so I'm glad they didn't put that on the screen. There's no actual flashback sequence though of the, the Meeps and how the Wrath Warriors are explaining how the Meeps actually got mutated because their planet was chucked out of orbit and put closer to the, a black sun which mutated their personalities and made them more savage beasts who lived for conquest because that was a proper scene that we got to see in the comic and I was a bit surprised that wasn't included there. Um, missed opportunity in my opinion. Oh and can we just talk about how overpowered the Sonic has become? There's a scene where the Doctor and the Noble family are being attacked in their home by the possessed unit soldiers and the Wrath Warriors and the Doctor uses the Sonic screwdriver to create like this portable barrier or field to protect them from the weaponry fire. Now, maybe this is just me, but I thought that was ridiculous. The fact that, you know, oh, we can just make a portable force field now with the sonic screwdriver. I mean, whoa, talk about overpowered. The intro, um, it was okay. I like the visual aspect of it, but theme tune, I'm not a fan of. Not really liking it. Oh yeah, and we of course got the new TARDIS interior revealed, which is just gorgeous and hugely spacious, and I love how it's a callback to classic Doctor Who, but it looks like it's like a merge between classic and and Tenant's TARDIS console room as well. I, I like that. But overall, the episode, I, I don't know, I, I don't hate the episode. It's not that good though, in terms of enjoyability. There's not much I get out of it. I had an idea of what to expect in terms of the story, thinking that this episode would probably be pretty faithful to adapting the comic but I think it was too heavy-handed with its message, and it does at times feel like it's talking down to the audience. It's great to see David Tennant and Catherine Tate come back as they slip right back into the characters so effortlessly, and are honestly the best things about watching these specials. Like, I'm watching them for these two on screen. But one special in, and it's just kind of a disappointing letdown, and I can't really say that there was one scene in particular where I was like, oh my god, I want to go back and re-watch that because that scene was amazing. It, it, it doesn't really have that for me. Wild Blue Yonder. Now this one I enjoyed a hell of a lot more than I did that of the Star Beast. So the Doctor and Donna find themselves at the end of the universe on an abandoned spaceship shrouded in mystery with danger lurking all around them. Now, I will say this, what was told to us about this episode about being unlike anything Doctor Who has ever done before, well, that wasn't exactly true. I mean, it's an isolated base under siege story, which is what Doctor Who does best. It does borrow ideas from Midnight, which is another episode that was written by Russell T. Davis as well, with our characters being stuck in an isolated environment with an alien creature 
that is mimicking those around it and slowly trying to become them. It does have, well, I suppose the only thing it features is the Doctor and Donna and no other supporting characters whatsoever. And that in itself is different. It's definitely weird. It has a lot of creepiness in the episode, which the director does a great job of capturing the atmosphere of the story and really selling you on how isolated it is, not only with inside the spaceship itself, but feeling like they're completely cut off of all life. That was something that was really well done. The episode itself gives a great opportunity for the actors to showcase their talents and acting ability as they play off their evil mimicking duplicates so well. Especially David Tennant. Oh my god, David Tennant is really acting in this episode. There isn't much negatives I can actually give the story apart from the pre-intro scene with Isaac Newton. I mean, I was aware that they race swapped Isaac Newton. That wasn't something that, you know, offended me personally. I noticed it, I saw it, and I was like, mm, okay. I think I was just more annoyed with the fact that they decided to use this cheap gag with renaming Gravity, Mavity. I just wasn't a fan of that. It feels so tonally off with the rest of the story. I do like how the whole thing is a mystery and how the captain hoped to kill these creatures around it by having this countdown and it'd be so slow and it's a countdown to a bomb that kills hopefully these creatures. I thought that was a really clever idea. The scene where towards the end of the story where the doctor picks up the wrong Donna and for a split moment I, I was actually convinced that Donna was going to die and I was like oh wow this is going to play into the giggle and the doctor's going to go back and rescue Donna and this is going to manipulate time but no no that didn't happen at all. Uh, the scene where the doctor doesn't know uh, that he's talking to the mimic Donna about the flux and destroying half the universe which for whatever reason was never brought up again after Flux, it was nice to have some sort of answers in what happened in terms of the actual consequences of the Flux. And when Tenet breaks down afterwards, it was really emotional and that was such a great scene. You really felt the Doctor's pain and anguish in that moment. Uh, Russell did double down though on the Timeless Children, which, oh my god, I don't like the Timeless Children whatsoever. I think of this, if you're a new viewer and you're coming into these specials and you hear this, I, I, I don't know what the hell you're going to be thinking because you're not going to be able to follow this at all. There were some fans that were ridiculing like the CGI within this episode where the Doctor is like walking on all fours and that. For me, like the CGI doesn't really bother me that much. Because, I mean, I watch classic Doctor Who. I'm looking at the story, I'm looking at the cast, I'm looking at the performances of the actors. Special effects in Doctor Who for me are like just like a secondary thing because I'm always so invested within the characters and the story and what's going on. So that didn't bother me. But Wild Blue Yonder itself, it's a pretty solid episode, but in terms of feeling like an anniversary special, it doesn't really feel that celebratory of an episode. It just feels inconsequential in trying to feel like an anniversary. Okay, the giggle the third and final special I found to be the most engaging out of the three. It fell apart towards the end for most of the episode though, I found it enjoyable. This is what I really wanted more from the previous two specials. Instead of kind of feeling like filler, the giggle feels more like it's a celebratory episode and that comes down to the fact that they did bring back a lot of these pre-established characters like the toy maker who hasn't been seen for what? 56 years or something? They brought him back. Great casting with Neil Patrick Harris. I'll touch on him later. Mel returns. She has some nice character moments here and there. Kate Stewart as well. I think if you remove Mel and Kate from the story itself, it would just be a standard Doctor Who episode and the 60th anniversary specials wouldn't feel that special whatsoever. They just feel like, okay, this is kind of filler until we get to Chudy Gatwa. The episode itself, it picks up directly after the cliffhanger of Wild Blue Yonder with now all of humanity driven insane from the giggle lingering in everyone's head, throwing the entire world into complete and utter chaos. And now an old enemy from the Doctor's past has returned, the Toymaker, to play one final game with the Doctor. I actually liked how the Toymaker has turned everyone insane with Stooky Bill on every screen around the world. Everyone is right in their own mind and their own opinions are superior to everyone else's and they refuse to be told otherwise, which causes everyone to fight. Very much an allegory for people of social media and the negativity it brings out in people. I found that actually hilarious. Um, again, the, there is messaging within this one. It's not as heavy handed as I found with the Star Beast. But the messaging itself with being like anti-social media, I just found that hilarious. How it brings out the negativity in people and how everyone are just ravaged 
insane people. I, I found that funny, especially the scene when we cut to the UK uh, Prime Minister, I think it is, where he's, he's just like going off and he's like, why should I care about you? And, and Donna reacts, oh, well, there's nothing changed there. I found that really, really funny. It was great to see Bonnie Langford back as Melanie Bush. Now, I gotta admit, you know, Mel, really in the classic series for me, she ain't that memorable of a character, okay? She kind of was really never given much to do. She was like a computer programmer and they never really brought that up in the classic series. Um, she has some nice little moments here and there with the Doctor and how she's talking about, you know, Sabalon glitz tripping over a whiskey bottle, which is how he died. And I love that. That's such a very glitz thing. Like that, I could totally see Sabalon glitz doing that. And that moment when she says that she came back and she had no family, that's that's a really nice touching moment. The Avengers like Unit Tower, still not a fan of that. I liked how the Doctor was commenting on talking about Kate's father, the Brigadier, of how he worked day and night to keep Unit a secret. I like that. Kate doesn't have much to do, but feels better utilized in this episode than she did in Flux. And there was uh, the Vlinks, which was like this robot or AI or whatever the hell it was. Its voice, it reminded me so much of the Megarians from the Terror of the Vervoids, which I really liked. Neil Patrick Harris, oh my god. Talk about perfect casting. He was such a joy and so brilliant to watch. Steals every single moment he's in. He has such a great and yet creepy maniacal laugh. The toy maker is so zany and maniacal in this episode, and you definitely believe that he's this all-powerful being. Especially when the Doctor goes into the toy maker's domain with Donna, and the toy maker is controlling John Logie Bird's assistant uh, as a puppet. That was really creepy, and some great stuff there in the in the whole domain of the toy maker. And when the toy maker it storms into unit and, and has that dance number with the Spice Girls song, Spice Up Your Life, and how he turns some of the soldiers into, into balls and then completely diffuses all their bullets by turning them into petals. I thought that was really cool. It showcased how powerful the toy maker was as a character and how zany he really was as well. I still really like Michael Goff as the original toy maker from the Celestial Toy Maker. I think the Celestial Toy Maker itself is a good episode. It's just hindered by its budget. But I much prefer Neil Patrick Harris as the toy maker. I think he's just the superior version. I, I absolutely loved and adored the toy maker in this episode. There's also a scene where the Doctor is being taunted by the toy maker. And the toy maker is like showing puppets of the doctor's previous companions after Donna. But the scene is kind of pointless because it doesn't really go anywhere. I don't know what the point of that was because the toy maker must have known the doctor would play and the doctor already knew he was going to play. So I don't know what the point of that scene was. Something they did make very clear in this episode is this is the next time the doctor has faced the toy maker since the celestial toy maker. So the unmade Doctor Who story, The Nightmare Fair, which was originally part of the original season 23 season, I guess isn't canon, which I was actually surprised with. I always liked The Nightmare Fair. I always considered it canon. The book is much better than the Big Finish audio in my opinion. And the Toymaker's final game with the Doctor in the Nightmare Fair is super underwhelming, with the Doctor having to just match the Toymaker's high score in a video game. I thought that was like bonkers, but whatever. But um, I always considered the story canon. The Giggle, I would say, is better than the Nightmare Fair though. It utilizes the Toymaker much better. Speaking of underwhelming, both the games that the Doctor plays with the Toymaker felt so disappointing. I mean, the first one was you know, okay, we're going to split apart a deck of cards and the highest number wins. Uh, what? And then the second one was just so completely, unbelievably ridiculous. I don't believe that this all-powerful celestial god plays a game of catch with a fucking ball and gets tuckered out and isn't able to catch the ball, resulting in him losing. <laughs> Serious? I'm sorry, I just think that makes no sense to me whatsoever. It doesn't hold a candle to the Trilogic game that the Doctor plays in the Celestial Toymaker, and how the Doctor in that episode as well, how he outwits him. I was expecting something more complex than catching a fucking ball, and the whole reasoning behind why the 14th Doctor has this face from his past. I wanted something a bit more conclusive. I mean, I don't know if conclusive is the right word. This is not the explanation you're looking for. Yeah, I don't believe that at all. You're kind of sucked. I'm bored. I suppose I just really wanted the toy maker to be behind it right from this very beginning, pulling the strings to bring the Doctor and Donna together, rather than the reason this face came back is because 
doctor is wearing himself out and it's time for him to settle down, I felt completely let down with that. The mystery felt greater than that of the payoff which felt underwhelming. I don't know, it's probably one of those instances, for me it's like expectations versus reality and my expectations were just too high which ultimately let down me liking this. Okay, I'm gonna touch on now the most controversial thing about the episode, the new bi generation which splits the Doctor into two rather than just regenerate him into a new body. I was aware of the rumours surrounding it, I think it didn't come as quite the shock for me. I still have mixed feelings on it though. I thought the biggest thing that hurt this, this new bi-generation from a traditional red generation, is the fact that it distracts from Chudy Gatwa's first moments as the Doctor. I thought he was overshadowed by the fact that you know, now I'm more focused and drawn to Tenet and I have all these questions about this. Does this mean 14 can't regenerate anymore? And will he just age gracefully? And if he can regenerate, does he regenerate into Chudy? Or does he cycle back through his previous incarnation? Is this how we have the curator? Or is he the watcher from Legopolis? And is he going to be around exactly the same time as Chudy as well? Is this going to be something that's brought up every time the Doctor comes back Is to Earth? Is this by generation now the new consisting thing that will continue to happen every regeneration going forward? I think this kind of cheapens each Doctor's regeneration now, knowing they that just go on living. I hope they do go back to a more traditional regeneration. And I hope this is just a one-off thing. I wasn't so much annoyed with the by generation. It was just all the confusion it left me with, and how I really didn't buy into the fact that the 14th Doctor is now going to settle down with the Noble family. Because the Doctor isn't going to be able to cope very long for being retired on one planet. I mean, it kind of feels out of character to me. It's something I don't buy the Doctor actively choosing that he wants to settle down because he feels so burnt out and tired. I mean, he was exiled in the third Doctor era on Earth. And at every single moment, he was trying to look for a way to escape his exile. Because he couldn't stand being confined to one single planet. So I just, I don't buy into that. Especially with the 14th Doctor. If it was something that was like, I don't know. I think it would have made more sense for like something like Capaldi's Doctor. It was not the payoff I was hoping for. And plus, we kind of already saw this anyway with Tennant, with the whole Metacrisis Doctor. The, he was half human and he chose to spend the rest of his life with Rose in the parallel world back in like, uh, what was it, Journey's End? I mean, so it's just, we're, we're repeating the same things here. It's like, why the hell does he have to have a happy ending again? They, they pretty much leave it open that 14 can make another appearance down the line, whether it's in this show again, or it's in that unit spin-off show, which was heavily rumoured, or any other spin-off show, or hell, maybe he'll even get his own spin-off show, or maybe he'll appear in Tales of the Tardis. <laughs> and if that's the case, if he gets his own spin-off show, I think that's just going to create a lot of confusion. Because, like, the audience is going to be confused with the fact that Chudy's the Doctor, but wait, there's a spin-off show with David Tennant as the Doctor, and he's the Doctor at, at, at the same time as Chudy's the Doctor, and they're... Oh, it's just so much confusion. I would have preferred a much more traditional regeneration you know like i would have preferred if like just the 14th doctor got hit with the galvanic beam by the toy maker and he just regenerates into the 15th doctor and then chudy has to go and defeat the toy maker i think that would have made more sense it would have been better and it doesn't leave me asking so many questions at the end and it doesn't overshadow chudy's performance as the doctor in those very first moments doesn't leave me asking so many questions afterwards that just gives me a friggin aneurysm. And as for Chudy's performance as the Doctor, well I really can't judge him on those really three seconds because I really didn't get a sense of of him as the Doctor. Uh, I think I'll have to wait until the Christmas special before I can formulate a full opinion on him. He didn't really have enough time to shine as the Doctor. I, I really liked his theme though. I, I said this on Twitter ages ago before when, when they released it. The 15th Doctor's theme I, I like. But overall, what did I think of the 60th anniversary specials and how the show decided to celebrate its 60 year history? Well, it's a mixed bag for me. We have one episode that has a few good moments here and there, but is very pandering with its message. Another episode that is pretty solid as a base under siege story, but didn't really feel special and the final episode felt more of what I wanted and expected to get out of an anniversary special with characters from the past returning, but I thought it was let down in its last 10-15 minutes of the episode. It was of course amazing to see David Tennant and Catherine Tate return. The episodes were all very well directed. I wanted it to feel more like a celebration of Doctor Who's history. Now that doesn't necessarily mean 
that every anniversary special has to be a multi-doctor story. I suppose, technically speaking, though, the giggle in its last 10 minutes is a multi-doctor story, which kind of contradicts what Russell T. Davies said about him not liking multi-doctor stories, but he makes one anyway, whatever. The specials just really needed to be more of an acknowledgement and a celebration of what has come before and the endearing legacy that this show has. I felt they missed the mark with all these episodes. They don't really feel that connected. They're more like standalone episodes. They should have been building up to the toy maker from the very beginning. Like have him be a larger presence connecting all these specials together. Have him manufacture the 14th Doctor's regeneration into having a face from his past and him meeting Donna again. That would have made it feel more like a mini series rather than a bunch of standalone episodes. And for me, that was what made these specials feel super underwhelming. Oh my god, I sound so entitled right now. I think it's one of those cases where my expectations were too high, which is probably one of the contributing factors with my distaste, I guess you could say, of these episodes being underwhelming. But as I said before, you know, it was great to see David Tennant and Catherine Tate. They were fantastic. Best thing about the specials. I mean, it, it is great to see that these specials were popular with people. Like, I think the Starbies got like 7 million or over that for its viewing figures in the UK alone. Which is a pretty good sign that people are still interested in the show. But like, ugh. For me, as a fan, like, I'm a fan of Classic Who. I grew up with David Tennant as the Doctor. I think the kindest thing I can say about it is it just, it felt underwhelming. But let me know what you thought in the comments about the three specials, the Star Beast, Wild Blue Yonder, and the Giggle. Be sure to follow me on my socials, which will be in the link in the description down below as ever. And of course, you've been watching another Who View video. I hope to see you next time. Bye for now.